he bought almost every onion in America, he made millions, and he got away with it. And no one has heard of this guy. Hey everyone, you're gonna love this story, it is wild. And you'll learn something about economics too. Vincent Kasuga is a legend in the onion world, because he pulled off the greatest onion heist in history. This is the story of how he came to be known as the Onion King. Today's video is sponsored by Onions. If you're looking for a way to ruin your burger, try Onions. Before we can get into the story, we need to look at one big part of what Vincent did, the art of cornering a market. So what exactly does that mean? In a free market, the price of an item should, in theory, regulate itself. Let's say you own a store that sells cat yogurt, the tasty new yogurt made from 100% cat milk. If you're selling this fantastic new product at a price of, say, $39, but all the other stores in town are selling cat yogurt for only $1.99, sooner or later you'll have to lower your price, or your customers are just going to get their delicious feline dairy elsewhere. But what if you sent some of your employees to the other stores in town and made them buy up all their stock of cat yogurt? And then you went to the cat yogurt factory and did a deal with them to buy, say, three quarters of all the yogurt they produce in future. Well, now you control a massive amount of the supply and you can charge almost anything you like, knowing people will pay it. Because after all, this stuff is horrendously addictive. So that's what cornering a market is. And it's nothing new. We can go back to the 6th century BC and fails of... fails of... M Miletus? Hold on. Fail... We can go back to the 6th century BC and Thales of Miletus, a philosopher and astronomer who, one winter, used his knowledge of astronomy to figure out that there was going to be a bumper crop of olives that year. So he went and bought up all the olive presses in the region, because if you want to make bank on olive oil, you need olive presses. And when the summer came, and suddenly there was a huge demand for olive presses, he was able to rent them out for whatever price he liked, because he owned all of them. So back to Vincent Kasuga. He was a five foot four New York farmer with a big personality. He started onion farming in the 1930s, and he managed to make quite a lot of money from it. So much, in fact, that he was able to fund his habit of making big bets at the Merck, or Chicago Mercantile Exchange, a sort of stock market for food. He started off trading wheat, but there was just one problem. He was really bad at it. Vincent nearly lost everything. He had to take out a new mortgage on his farm, and his wife made him promise to never do it again. And so he promised. He would never again use their finances to make such a large, irresponsible gamble. On wheat. Vince was an onion farmer. He knew if he was going to make big money, it'd have to be on onions. Not only that, but he'd also need to start playing dirty. You see, the Merc was full of shady characters who didn't mind bending the rules to make some money, even if it did screw over someone else. And Vincent was going to join their ranks. One of his first big wins on onions was thanks to a weatherman. As an onion farmer, Vincent knew frost was bad news. It kills the onion plant, meaning there's fewer to sell. So he hatched an intricate, multi-step plan, ingenious in its design, that would take years to come to fruition and require a massive amount of effort and cunning. And then he thought, nah, I'll just bribe them instead. So he bribed the weather office. They issued the frost warning, and people started buying up all the onions they could at whatever price was being asked. Vincent was betting the other way. And when the frost never materialised, and prices crashed, Vincent made a lot of money at everyone else's expense. But this was nothing compared to the audacious scheme he would carry out next. He was going to corner the market in onions. To corner the onion market in 1955, Vince had to buy up all the onions in the US. But with that came another problem. He needed somewhere to store thousands of onions. He built a huge warehouse on his farm, but he soon realised that wasn't going to be big enough. So he found a warehouse in Texas, one in Michigan, a couple in California. 
There were warehouses all around the country just brimming with onions. But surely people could just wait for more onions to grow and buy those. Well, he'd thought of that too. He knew his way around the Merc, which means he knew how to buy onion futures. And so, with Okay, remember that onion prices could go up and down based on things like the weather? Well, if you're an onion farmer, it's not particularly helpful for your income to vary so wildly like that. Onion futures were a contract between a farmer and a futures trader, where the trader would promise to buy those future onions for a set price. The farmer would have a guaranteed income, and the trader would be hoping that by the time the contract is fulfilled, he can sell the farmer's onions for a much higher price. Okay, so Vincent bought all the onions and all the onion futures. At this point, he controlled 98% of that onion market. He had successfully cornered the market, although at great expense to himself and his business partner. Now, onions in the US were hard to find, and as supplies dwindled, prices increased. This was great news for the onion farmers. They were able to sell their product at record highs. But it was time for Vincent to make his profit. Towards the end of 1955, Vincent called a meeting with all the head honchos of the onion business. Onion Larry, Crying Steve, I don't actually know what these people were called. He says to them, I've got a lot of onions saved up and I want you to buy them from me at this price. And they look at him like, why would we buy your onions? We grow our own onions. And he says, well, if you do, I'm going to keep buying onion futures and keep the price high. We're talking $4 a bag high. But if you don't, I'm going to sell them on the open market and it's going to tank the price of onions for a long time and ruin you. So they don't have a choice. They buy almost 9 million pounds of Vincent's onions. But that doesn't matter. They can just grow more onions and easily make that money back at these prices. Right? Most people would be pretty happy with cornering a market and making a killing, but Vincent wanted more. He'd already made so much money making the price of onions go up, but he still had a bunch of onions just sitting around. Now it was time to make the price go way back down. He spent the next few weeks quietly making bets that the price of onions would fall, just a small amount each day, but over time this built up into one giant bet that the price of onions was going to crash. And before anyone noticed what he was doing, he laid on his surprise. In March 1956, Vincent flooded the market with onions. And I mean that very literally. Normally, a futures trader wouldn't actually take delivery of the thing they were trading. They'd sell it on to someone who actually wanted them, a distributor or something. But to really make his point, Vincent brought all of the onions to the exchange. Trucks, train yards, docks, Chicago was overflowing with bags of onions. And no trader wants to be stuck holding a worthless bag. Actually, those mesh bags that contain the onions, they were normally worth 20 cents. But a bag of onions was now worth 10 cents. Putting onions into the bag had literally halved its value. That's how worthless onions were now. They couldn't even give them away. They called orphanages, hospitals, nobody wanted to take these onions. People had to pay to have them hauled away and destroyed. Some just dumped them in the Chicago River. This absolutely ruined the onion growers and the futures traders. Some went bankrupt, some committed suicide. Vincent Kasuga made $8.5 million. And if that sounds like a lot, remember, that was 1956. Today, that's about 90 million. The government were outraged. Congress held hearings and even interviewed Vince. His defense? If it's against the law to make money in the United States, then I'm guilty. Which obviously is a pretty flimsy defense that couldn't possibly have. Oh, yeah, that worked. He paid a small fine and was suspended from trading for a grand total of 10 months. He got away with it. But Congress did do something. In 1958, they passed the Onion Futures Act to make sure that nobody could do this one very specific thing again. I mean, it literally only covered onions, nothing else. 
To this day, it's the only agricultural product that you can't legally trade futures in in the United States. And this isn't even that good for the farmers. Remember how I said earlier that futures were actually a good thing for them because it gave them some certainty in how much they could sell for? Well, today, growing onions in the US is riskier and costlier than it otherwise should be because the farmers legally cannot sell those onions until they're out of the ground. Everyone lost out, except for... Vince did do a bit more trading after his suspension, but he mainly focused on his family and, oh, spending that massive amount of money he made. He opened a restaurant on his farm called The Jolly Onion and made himself the chef. You can still go there, by the way, it's apparently pretty good. He also donated so much to the Catholic Church, they let him meet four popes. That's a lot of popes. I don't know if we can call Vincent a hero or a villain. He did pull off an incredibly daring plan and made himself very rich, but he also screwed over a lot of people in the process. It's an interesting question. If you had the opportunity to make a lot of money, but knew that doing so would destroy lives, would you still do it? And if so, would you still think of yourself as a good person? Either way, hero or villain, I think there's one description that you can't deny, that he earned the title, the Onion King. <laughs>